morning, everyone. What in the world is a meteorologist doing here today? Have you all looked outside? Probably not a bad idea to have a meteorologist uh, with the weather uh, as it is. Uh, I think most of you are going to be flying home Thursday. Good luck with that. Uh, you know, uh, actually in my, my research, as Kathleen said, on severe storms and tornadoes, uh, I deal a lot with glass. It's usually flying through the air, and people are trying to stay low and avoid it. But uh, I was actually so bad at forecasting, uh, they decided to send me to the White House for two years where I could not do as much harm. So, uh, so there I uh, was, as, as Kathleen said, director of the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy and, and science advisor to the president. And so I'm going to share a few things that I worked on there, especially with a colleague who I think some of you know, uh, A.N. Shriram, who's the vice president of Dow Chemical, uh, a great member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And so he asked me if I would be uh, willing to come here, and Kathleen was very gracious to invite me, and I'm so, so pleased to be here. Uh, Etch-a-sketches, I think, were developed before we had uh, Gorilla Glass, unfortunately. I think mine broke many times. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the innovation enterprise, which is so critically important to our country. And you know, we're living in an extraordinary time, uh, amazing time in science technology for all the reasons that you've heard. Wendell really put a fine point on this. So tremendous advances are being made, uh, whether it's high performance computing, networking, whether it's understanding the human brain, sequencing the human genome. Uh, we're, we're just, there's just an amazing amount of uh, science technology going on. Uh, here in the United States and globally as well. Um, we're living also in a very, very special place here in America where we have some of the world's top universities, major private companies, Corning, and many of the ones that are represented here and, and graciously sponsoring this event are so well represented. We have national and federal laboratories, uh, it, it's trillion dollar companies. It's really, really an amazing place here in America. So what a great time to be alive, what a great time to be doing what we're doing here in America. Of course, the starting point for the, the current enterprise that we enjoy was a gentleman named Vannevar Bush, who uh, ultimately founded a company called Raytheon, but he was President Roosevelt's uh, science advisor. And uh, before uh, Roosevelt passed away toward the end of World War II, he asked, uh, he asked Vannevar Bush to kind of uh, figure out how to bring the Manhattan Project and all the great things that were being developed in the, uh, in the science enterprise that allowed the Allies to win the war, how that could be brought to the benefit of civil society. And so he penned this treaty, Science the Endless Frontier. And if you haven't read it, it's a very, very quick read, but it's very profound uh, in its importance. And it, it basically said three things. One, if there are all, all the research that's being done is sort of classified, let's bring it out into the open as much as possible. Number two, let's invest, invest in fundamental scientific research. And number three, let's make sure we develop the workforce of the future. And that's basically what that document said. And it really set the stage for what is our innovation ecosystem today. We have world-leading colleges and universities, uh, independent research institutes. Uh, they depend upon organizations like the National Science Foundation. My dear friend and colleague, Punch, will be up here to talk about that next. Uh, and, and so they they're get, get that sort of funding from grant proposals and so on. Of course, private industry, very, very important to, to innovate, as we'll talk about. Uh, we also have uh, non-profit, non-government organizations that are very, very important. We have entrepreneurs, individual people. We have 16-year-olds who would visit the White House and tell me how they were starting private companies. It was just amazing. And a middle school in Florida was launching CubeSats. It was absolutely extraordinary what these young, young folks are doing. We have investors and, and business accelerators now that weren't around even 10 or 15 years ago. And then, of course, uh, finally, we have traditional and social media, which are extremely important. And, if you put all this together, this is our innovation ecosystem. Uh, all told, you look at federal R&D investment, government, state R&D investment, private sector, it's about 600, north of $600 billion a year. It's an extraordinary amount of money. But then you add in all the other sources of innovation, it's well over a trillion dollars a year. It's really an amazing enterprise. Uh, but I don't want to go too far without uh, defining a couple of words that sometimes are a little bit tricky here. Innovation, the process by which research outcomes and technology and ideas are converted into goods and services. Um, scientists are innovative, but they don't necessarily innovate. They use creative ideas to generate new knowledge, but they don't necessarily innovate on that. That's, that's the purview, really, of a lot of the private sector companies that are represented here today, and then bring that value, as we've seen so brilliantly uh, portrayed today, to the benefit, uh, benefit of society. And then, of course, an ecosystem. There we go. I love this, this uh, kind of developed this out of multiple uh, sources, but it's a complex community. I think we know that those, uh, those uh, circles I showed, they're pretty complex. But they form an environment that function as sort of an interdependent, coherent unit. And what's important, what I want to talk about here is, can we do better in terms of that coherency, that interdependence, that, that linkage across all of those 
different circles that I showed a moment ago. So you look at this system that has evolved since the end of World War II, and you say, how well have we done? You know, well, there are a lot of measures. There's thousands, millions of measures one could look at. We have seven of the top 10 universities uh, in the world. We have trillion dollar companies. We developed a COVID vaccine, I should say an effective vaccine, in less than a year, and, and the packaging, obviously, that went with it. We have the largest number of Nobel laureates of any country by far. Uh, innovations in glass that you've heard uh, know a lot more about than I do that have absolutely changed the course of mankind. And fiber optics, we heard about that gorilla glass. Uh, thin eye glass lenses, which I'm uh, very grateful for. I got rimless glasses when I was in college. They looked like pop bottle lenses. They were literally a quarter of an inch thick. And now my eyes are a lot worse and the lenses are a lot thinner. So, so thank you all for that. I looked dirty enough the way it was. I didn't need any help. Uh, Pyrex and neutrino detectors and, and laser fusion lenses looking at, um, at creating fusion, the, the amount of energy and the, the heat needed to actually develop fusion. Uh, the, the, the lenses used to, to focus those 16 or 18 lasers, so important to develop, uh, very, very dependent upon uh, advanced glass. So we're doing great. We've done extraordinary things, but we do face a lot of challenges. There are a lot of reports out there, a lot of data out there that, that I think Poncho will probably talk a little bit about that show you know we're not really bringing the next generation into the system as, as effectively as we need to. Our patents and our, our licensing are falling behind other parts of the world. And as one of Poncho's predecessors at NSF said, uh, science anywhere is good for science everywhere. And I absolutely believe in that. But America needs to continue leading, not only with its R&D ecosystem, but also with our American values of openness and transparency and accountability to really continue to be a beacon for the world. <laughs> Of, of innovation and, 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 and excellent research. So, but we have, we have fallen short. Uh, we've done a lot of great things. We've fallen short in a lot of ways. Uh, Ponch may talk about the missing millions. There are a lot of individuals out there in rural communities and underserved communities and under-resourced communities and populations that have tremendous capabilities, but they're not in the game. And so we're working very hard nationally. I was working at the White House, Ponch is working at NSF, to bring those individuals into the system, to help them achieve their goals and dreams, and to participate in our extraordinary enterprise. Uh, we have sort of unpredictable federal budgets. Have you noticed that at all? I mean, <laughs> now here's a meteorologist up there that you know, can't predict tomorrow's weather and telling that, you know, that we have unpredictable budgets, but it's really, really hard for those of you who are in academia or elsewhere to, to look at sustaining a budget. I mean, how do you build a private company if you don't know what the next quarter is going to be or whatever? We don't know year to year what the federal R&D budget's going to be, and a sawtooth pattern is not healthy for science. So that's very, very important. We need predictable budgets. We need to take a much longer term view of the world. Uh, and I say this because when you, and this is not about China or global competition, but in some sense it is. Um, China thinks long term, 30, 50 years in the future. We think the next quarter, the next, uh, you know, maybe election cycle, the next congressional uh, uh, budget cycle, whatever. We have to take a really, really, really long term view of our science and technology, engineering, research, education, enterprise, our innovation system and say, where do we want to go? Not, not the details, but what is the broad arc where our country ought to be going, both in terms of international relationships and what our investments ought to be, and use that as a way to frame year-to-year -year, uh, activities. We have aging facilities. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, hurdles to partnerships. Those of you in the private sector that try to work with academia or others, you know how difficult it is a lot of times with in, uh, intellectual property policies that, are, that tend to tie our hands, they tend to make it difficult for us to, uh, to work together. Uh, research burden on administrative, uh, administrative burden on researchers is really extraordinary. Uh, in academic institutions, on average, faculty spend 44% of their time on administrative activities associated with federal funding. Now that's, I don't know what the number ought to be, but 44% strikes me as awfully high. And so uh, I think that's something we really need to address. And, 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 and you know, mixed messages about international students. We need to be welcoming uh, to international students and be an open science enterprise, but we also have to make sure that we balance that with securing the integrity and capability of our research assets so things don't get stolen out from, uh, from beneath us. So, uh, you know, everything seems to advance a lot of times except our frameworks and our regulatory uh, uh, procedures and policies. Uh, there are some counterexamples of that. The, the hubs that uh, DOE and NSF are funding, these new regional hubs, are very, very important. They're kind of a, a new experiment, I would say. But, but for the most part, a lot of the things that we're doing, uh, like you were, you were talking about glass blowing for two millennia, we, we keep kind of keep doing the same thing over and over again as far as our administrative frameworks. 
So the community has been concerned about this for a long time. There have been many reports that have been written, including some put out by the National Academy of Sciences where we were last, uh, last evening. Uh, and they've been very, very important and profoundly impactful in terms of Congress and the funding that, that needs to come and, and the policies and so on. Um, and so, you know, that's been helpful. But, but you know, when you think about where we want to go, and this is so important for, for the, the age of glass, the era of glass, whatever we want to call it, for the future of our country and the world, uh, what we need to really have a vibrant, powerful, effective ecosystem of innovation uh, here's what we need. We need capable people. At the end of the day, it's about people, right? From, from the broadest cross-section of America, every zip code, every, every county in America, students, researchers, technicians, HVAC technicians who are, who are keeping instruments running, who are doing tremendous work in advanced manufacturing. Uh, I visited some places uh, when I was uh, at the White House. Uh, doing, they were doing work in building uh, reactors. It was a highly classified area that we went into. And I asked those folks, I said, so you know, what's your educational background? Uh, you're, you're doing amazing work here with these very, very advanced machines. No, I, I have a two-year technical degree or a four-year degree. I, I applaud that. I think that's fantastic. Not everyone needs to go get a PhD or a master's degree. We need to have a broad cross-section across all, uh, all educational attainment levels to make sure that we retain our capability here in America. Uh, we have to have sustained, predictable funding. We have to have facilities and technical support structures. We also have to have effective policy and administrative frameworks. And especially for the private companies, I want you to know we absolutely have to have a free market system and a regulatory environment that does not tie our hands. This is where China really kind of beats us up. We don't want to become China. We don't want to have sort of just a, a free-for-all. Uh, we want to have a regulatory environment that makes sense to where private companies can innovate, they can, they can do things in a very creative way, and they're not running into regulations all the time that tend to hamper their progress. So that's really, really important for our, our national innovation system. So I can tell you that we can throw a lot of money up in the air and, and hope that everything works, and, and unfortunately funding right now looks pretty good, uh, although NSF, uh, you know, in the last uh, appropriation cycle, didn't do well, uh, but there is still some hope for the uh, America Competes Act and the USICA, the U.S. Uh, Innovation and Competitiveness, Competitiveness Act, uh, which is very important. But I'd say that what we need to do is not just throw money at the problem, but we need to, we need to think about not use, utilizing the same models we've been using for a long time. You would not continue to invest in a company whose manufacturing uh, facilities are basically in the 1950s. You say, there's no ROI there for me. They're, 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 you know, they're falling behind. The world is moving past them. Well, we, that's true actually in our frameworks that we use to do R&D, our frameworks that we use to, to build partnerships with private companies and so on. So the ROI that we have there is, is really greatly diminished. We put a lot of money in. But as, as uh, I think what, what we, we saw earlier with that, uh, that decibel loss in, in the fiber cable, you get 100 units in and one unit out, we could get 100 units in and probably 98 units out if we start to rethink some of these structures that tend to fundamentally inhibit our capabilities. So it's time for us to shake this etch a sketch up a little bit. And uh, I didn't have the ability to, to shake the thing up. Uh, I didn't know how to do that, but I want you to know that uh, that we did put out a report uh, with Sri Ram. Is Sri Ram here? I don't know if he made it. I didn't see him last night. He's not here. Uh, but he was a very, very important part of this thing. It's called uh, Industries of the Future Institutes, a new model for American science and technology leadership. Basically what it says is we went out and we looked at a bunch of different structures, administrative frameworks, and you all remember the Venerable Bell Labs, which is at the top there. And there's, there's Semitech, there's the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany, there's a lot of these different organizations. And we looked at them and we said, do we really have what we need in America? Did we not learn some lessons from the pandemic that we could do things much, much more effectively, much more quickly, and still maintain integrity and accountability and safety if we basically didn't tie our hands with all these regulations? We didn't set them aside, but we basically said, we're going to streamline them. We're going to make it easier for us to move past these things and do it very quickly. And, you know, nine, ten months later, we have a vaccine. So we looked at this very carefully and we said, you know, there are a lot of things that we could do differently. And so why don't we run an experiment? We don't have to try to change the world all at one time. Let's run an experiment and see what we might do to develop a capability where we can actually uh, have some partnerships that don't look anything like what we're used to. Uh, and so here's what we did. We said, uh, let's create a framework, an R&D framework, that actually goes from fundamental basic research, fundamental research, discovery, kind of intellectual curiosity-driven research, all the way to scale up in a single administrative framework. So no, no handoff from, 
from this organization to this organization, crossing the valley of death, getting venture capital involved. Let's actually have a framework that goes all the way through the scale up process. And that scale up term was mentioned earlier. Um, have a situation where a fee can be in multiple sectors at once. What I mean by that is typically it's like, okay, professor is in academia, private sector person is over here, this other person is over here, and if you want to work together, you have to jump ship. So we see a lot of our high tech companies sort of mining all of the great minds out of universities to come work in the private sector companies, and that, of course, disadvantages our youth as we're trying to educate them. It's great for the private companies. They make the faculty make a lot more money, but, but why don't we create a framework where you can actually manage conflicts of interest and have one foot in both camps to where you're actually helping your students understand what it's like to work and live in the private sector. You're bringing that in the classroom, but you're also bringing some of the university capabilities and the academic framework into the private company, and you, you work together on this. So, so we talked about in this report how we can do that. Minimal government involvement. I know that's going to shock a lot of you and disappoint a lot of you, but what we have found, of course, is there's a lot of regulatory um, uh, policies out there. We saw this in the pandemic when I was at the White House that we really don't need. They're, they're tying our hands. They're holding us back. So. We, we thought here, if you read the report, we had a, a framework where we said, let's, let's really have it be driven by the private sector, by academic institutions, by nonprofits. Let the government be in there for, for some important reasons, but let the ship be driven by the private sector. So we have a framework where we have administrative overhead that is absolutely minimized. We don't come and review uh, a group of people uh, you know, four times a year. At my center that I had 11 years, this Science Technology Center Kathleen mentioned, we were reviewed 14 times in 11 years. And those are major reviews. That really hampers progress, right? So we said, look, let's, let's create an environment where people say, I want to go there. Uh, I want this to be the bell labs of all, where we have big ideas. We take intellectual risk, and if we put in $10 million or $20 million and we fail, that's OK, because we have learned something process. We don't do that so much anymore. We're intellectually risk averse, and that's not a good thing, I think, for our country. Workforce of the future and innovative IP policies, this is where Sri Ram really helped a lot, where our IP policies could help really speed activities to market, that transition of fundamental research through product development, through pre-production, through the actual scale-up. And here's the, here's the key thing. You say, how do you do all that? You can get waivers from the White House in the form of executive orders or presidential memoranda that say, we are going to run an experiment. We want to create this thing over here where we want to work with universities and a few private companies, a couple of nonprofits. And we want you, White House, you executive office of the president, <clears throat> to give us a waiver for some of these regulatory frameworks that we have to deal with in the office of management budget <clears throat> so we can go run this experiment. Let's, let's do a use case scenario. We did a global experiment called the COVID-19 pand pandemic, and we learned a heck of a lot from that. So let's not use the crisis of a global pandemic. Let's actually do this in a much more structured way and then take the lessons learned from that and improve our systems. That way, we're saying, OK, we're learning things, and this thing can actually be a proving ground, kind of a, a, a sandbox, if you will, for testing out new ideas of administrative frameworks to see if they work. And you go in and you say, you know what? We did this 10 times faster than before. It costs 30 times less. It's like, OK, let's scale that up. Let's move that into the policy of the United States of America and, and really become much more capable and, and, and quick than we are right today. So the importance of your community, I think, is vital. Um, you have an ideal opportunity, I think, to take this for a test drive. Uh, obviously, glass, as we've heard and will hear, is of critical importance to society, no question about that. And it spans a spectrum from basic fundamental research all the way to scale products, as, as you've also uh, talked about. It's not really politically contentious, uh, not like artificial intelligence. That's, that's pretty politically contentious, and I've done a lot with that when I was at the White House and a lot of other things, including plastic. Ocean plastic, ocean debris, a lot of challenges there. But, but glass is, is a pretty clean thing to deal with. And, and certainly environmentally, as we, we heard in the previous speaker, very, uh, very good uh, capabilities. You're, you're a close-knit community. I, I, I certainly know that. But you're not such a huge community that this idea is untenable. Okay? If it were physics or, say, uh, chemistry, you know, pure chemistry, physics, those, those are massive global communities. You're a global community. You're very large. But you're not so big that I think you couldn't make this happen. And look what you did. You got an international year of glass. You got a national day of glass. I think you guys are really, really well positioned for this. 
and you're also highly multidisciplinary. You have computer scientists, you have mathematicians, you have chemists, you have you know everybody that you need. And I think you could you could really bring this forward. So I would encourage you, and I'll give the link to Kathleen to really look at this report and say, you know, could we utilize some of the concepts of this report to kind of deal with some of the challenges that we have in America to where you could supercharge everything that you're doing from basic research in academia to scale up in private industry and developing partnerships to really go forward and, and make this next era of glass be one that, is, as we heard earlier today, the best is yet ahead. And I think you can make that happen. But I think this is one of the key things that will be part of the ingredient to make that happen. So, so thank you very much for your time. I look forward to hearing you.